To show you how easy it is to file a claim with GEICO, we hired a Nature Show host. In the native habitat of a suburban driveway, the poor victim of a broken windshield is left assessing his vehicle utterly helpless. Well, not true. If he's got GEICO, he can file a claim online, over the phone, or with his handy mobile app. But like a lone gazelle, he'll suddenly be left to fend for himself, awaiting his terrible fate. Nope. GEICO will assign him a designated claims team to help him out, too. So the gazelle gets his car fixed and everything. Wow. Nature is so cool. GEICO. Great service, without all the drama. <sighs> the only thing better than grinding all night for your side hustle is your roommate picking you up with Mickey D's breakfast. The perfect pickup deal. There's a deal for every morning at McDonald's. Right now, taste breakfast perfection when you get a warm and savory sausage McMuffin with egg for just $2.50. Price and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with combo meal. Welcome back to What's Up Doc, the documentary review podcast. I am your host, Gemma Delaney, and we are, as always, um, on all of your social media platforms. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we are on Instagram at What's Up Doc Podcast. Guys, we are on episode five, five of season two. And um, if you follow us on social media, you will know I've been kind of teasing this one out. I was letting you guess. Um, I did say that it had just been released, what we were going to review today, and it is The Forgotten West Memphis 3. So um, this was released uh, last weekend on Oxygen in the US. Um, as always, guys, look, if you're not based in the US, I got the link, so hit me up and I'll send it on to you. Um, and this one is a little bit different, I suppose. It's a docu-series, really, um, but it's more so than who's the director. It's presented and narrated by Bob Ruff, uh, Bob Ruff of uh, Truth and Justice podcast fame. So he's going into a little bit of investigative journalism. Um, and look, isn't that the dream for, for every true crime podcaster, let's be honest. So um, what's the purpose of this documentary? Uh, I guess, look, if you don't already know the story, um, it's a well-known story at this stage. The West Memphis Three, there's been several documentaries me- made on this subject um, there's been West of Memphis, Paradise Lost. I recommend you get out and watch those if you haven't already done so. But basically what it is, is it's to find out who killed the three young boys um, back in 1993. So like I said, if you hadn't heard of the case before, uh, it was Stevie Branch, Michael Moore and Christopher Byers. In 1993 in West Memphis, uh, they were found hogtied naked um in this like little stream off of a bayou um and straight away uh i suppose the, the police and the media jumped on it and went ah satanic ritual um because a the boys were naked and they were hogtied but also b uh, one of the young boys genitals what seemed to ha- have been removed um, so they thought this was some kind of satanic ritual um, and the US at the time was in the midst of its satanic panic. If you've never heard of that before, if you're not based in the US and it's, it's not relevant to you, Google it, look it up. It's a really interesting period in their history where the whole country went mad just thinking Satanism was taken over basically. Um, and the message I suppose that this documentary wants to get across and that Bob Ruff wants to get across is that the killer is still out there. The killer is still at large. Um, and you know, these, these boys have been kind of forgotten in the annals of time and it was a very cruel and very unusual, uh, death. Um, and I guess that's why it stuck with a lot of people and that's why the case fascinates a lot of people. So just in terms of any prior knowledge that I had of the subject, quite a bit to be fair, as I said, I have watched every other documentary made about this subject. Uh, like I already said, Paradise Lost, West of Memphis, those are on Netflix guys, so they're really easy to obtain if you want to get a bit of background in this subject before jumping straight into the Forgotten West Memphis 3. Um, but what did I expect? Um, I suppose I hoped that, you know, new evidence would come to light in terms of, you know, there's every day we're making massive leaps in terms of what we can do with DNA evidence. And, um, you know, I, I was... 
I wanted to know what the documentary would find um, and you know I wanted to see who was overlooked who, who what potential suspects would the documentary come up with that had hadn't um, been looked at more closely at the time that should have been looked at more closely at the time so look just to give a kind of brief synopsis of the documentary um, like I said presented and narrated by Bob Ruff of Truth and Justice podcast the boys that were killed in 1993 pretty much immediately after they were they were found um, the police jumped on the presumption that it was some kind of a satanic ritual and they jumped on the presumption that it was um, the three boys that ended up being prosecuted for the murder that was uh, Damien Eccles, Jesse Miskelly and Jason Baldwin and as a result of the police kind of refusing to look outside the box and think it could be anything other than a satanic ritual these three boys they were teenagers at the time they were like you know 17 18 at the time uh, they spent nearly two decades in jail despite the fact that there was absolutely nothing tying them to the crime there was no ev- evidence linking them to the crime uh, and in fact they had alibis as well um but yeah, it, it all kind of hung on Miskelly's confession. Um, so one of the boys, uh, Jesse Miskelly, actually confessed and gave the police details of these brutal murders that were carried out. Um, but as I said, it you know it, it should a be noted that they were all in their teens. Miskelly, in fact, was seventeen at the time, and he had an IQ of seventy two. And I suppose, look, if you're like myself and you're bouncing off the documentaries, you're into documentaries, you will know through the likes of confession tapes and that kind of thing that like confessing to a murder means sweet fuck all in the grand scheme of things. It's very easy to get a false confession and there have been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cases of false confessions that we now know they were false confessions, they've been exonerated and they've been released from jail after serving, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. Um, so, like, a confession is, is you can piss on a confession now, it means nothing. Um, but basically, I suppose, the difference between this documentary and the other ones that have been made about the case is that the other documentaries have focused on those boys, those teenagers, and their trial, and their conviction. So that's Eccles, Miskelly, and Baldwin. Um, but I suppose what Bob Ruff, what he is saying in this documentary and what the documentary itself is saying is that the real West Memphis three were the three boys that were murdered. The three little eight year olds that were that were hogtied um, and stripped and left in a ditch. They're the victims and they've been forgotten in all of this, in all of the ruckus that ensued, um, you know, with this like you know satanism and and it was just it it was blown up into something so big that the the real victims of this crime were actually forgotten about altogether um and he wants to see if he can solve the mystery um and it should also be noted this is not the first time that bob ruff has done this he's done this before so he's dipping his toe into investigative journalism and seeing if he can solve crimes um and look for being totally honest isn't that the that the fucking dream for all true crime podcasters really like you know that's that's why we get involved in this is that, you know we have this need to know more we have this need to solve the mystery and that's what it is it's the big who done it um and that's kind of where our drive comes from when it comes to you know true crime so bob ruff um what he does is he goes right back to the start of the investigation to pick it apart um and see look you know, what did they miss? What did they miss? Because they had blinkers on and they just went, yeah, these guys are a group of Satanists. And like I said, the country was in the grip uh, of that era of satanic panic. Um, And as well, Damien Eccles, who was kind of seen to be the ringleader, like the other guys were sentenced to life. He was actually sentenced to death. Um, He was already on the police's radar uh, you know he was an atheist kid and memphis is a you know devoutly baptist town so he was already different like as i suppose he was 
if you look at pictures of him back then, I suppose he was like an emo kid. You know, he was the earliest version of the goth or the emo kid or whatever. And because he looked different, because he acted different and he was into things maybe of a more dark nature, he must have been the killer of these three boys. Um, so it was a fucking witch hunt, you know. Um, and really, I suppose what this documentary is showing is that because it was this witch hunt, it messed up any chance of a real fair trial it blinkered the police and it it made them oblivious to evidence um that was just staring them in the fucking face um so that that's kind of what you know this documentary is is looking to focus on i suppose um it's really interesting i mean i have followed this case from the get-go i suppose so i know a fair bit about it but i think it'll be a nice little introduction into this case for anybody who hasn't um, what I liked, I suppose, about this was that there was aspects I didn't know. So, you know, in the course of Bob Ruff's investigation, he found out that there was people that were never interviewed in the area, despite being like living right beside where the boys were found. So he does this very nice thing where he brings you back to the location of the crime. It has changed dramatically over the years. It does not look like what it did. Um, back in 1993, the wooded area where their bodies were found um, has been bulldozed. And but, but he shows you, he kind of recreates it and he shows you that right beside where the bodies were fi- found at the other side of the river, there was actually like a little, um, like a little estate of houses. Um, sorry now, if you're not from Ireland, you don't know what an estate is. What is it in America? Like a little grouping of houses built together um and yeah they were found right beside that so you know he goes through police notes there was only 140 pages of police notes like this was a triple homicide um that just that in in itself 140 pages is you wipe your arse with that like that's ridiculous um but yeah and and the notes are handwritten and they're so simple like knocked on door no answer and if they didn't get an answer at the door, they simply didn't return. Simple as. So there was a lot of people who were excluded from the case that probably shouldn't have been or that were never spoken to to begin with. And then they never followed up on it. So it's just all this kind of mad shit going on. Um, but yeah, so that housing estate has now been bulldozed beside where they were found. Um, and, and there was loads of people there that weren't investigated. Um, But what I liked that Bob Ruff did was, like I said, he goes back to the scene of the crime and he literally tries to come up with a timeline. So what he's doing um, is trying to come up with when they were killed based on, you know, witness eye accounts, when they were last seen, testimonies that they have. And he actually goes back and he talks to the people who gave these original testimonies to make sure that they're rock solid. Or that they can be excluded as well. So um, he, he goes and speaks to several people. I should also mention that Stevie's mother, uh, brother and aunt are all in this documentary as well. So that's really interesting. It's nice to have their angle, their 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 say on things as well and, and get their little input. Um, and the poor mother like Pam Hobbs, you can see that it's still so raw in her that she, you know, 26 years later or whatever she's still she's still right back there that day where her son's fo- uh, body was found hogtied in a in a fucking stream you know um i imagine that would be so hard to get over so hard because it's such a jesus it's such a brutal death as well for an 8 year old like and god no death is right for an 8 year old don't get me wrong but it's there's something really like hogtied like they're a fucking animal you know it's it's just really like discarding them like they're nothing um But they speak to all of them through the course of the documentary. And like I said, they talk to other people who had given testimonies to see if they can be excluded or included or if their stories are coherent with what they definitely know. So they follow up on a couple of leads. Um, And basically what they ascertain is that the three boys, you know, despite popular belief, they weren't actually together the whole day. Um, they met up after school but there were periods of time where the three of them weren't together where one or more of the boys returned home and then they grouped back together before finally making their way to that woods um, where unfortunately obviously they were killed so 
that's an interesting aspect as well and they kind of go into those different avenues and um, just to see who saw the boys and like I said whether those witness accounts can actually be you know whether they're credible or not whether they can actually be included in the timeline but by doing this what Bob Ruff does is he determines that in the course of the timeline the period of time where the boys would have have to have been killed I guess um, or the most likely time for them to be killed um, and then what he does is he goes back and he looks at people and he says you know who was excluded initially from this investigation because the police were so fucking gung-ho that it was Eccles and that it was Mescali and that it was Baldwin that should have been looked at in more detail um, and I suppose this is kind of my favourite part of the documentary because I love a good FBI profiler. So that's what they do. They get an FBI profiler in. Um, and I think FBI profiler, I always think Mindhunter. Bring back Mindhunter. But um, yeah, they bring this guy in and uh, he sat down at the table with Bob Roff and uh, Bob Roff has given him his findings and, you know, everything that they can determine from the, from the crime. Um, and the FBI profiler profiles the killer what he based on this crime the type of crime it is based on the evidence available who this person would be and basically you know if you watch anything like mind hunter or if you are into true crime i'm assuming you are if you're listening to a, a true crime documentary review podcast but what fbi profilers do is they determine based on the evidence who the killer would be and by doing that they small um they decrease i suppose that or they make smaller the pool of people that they have to look at so instead of looking at everyone and going any of you could be the killer they determine what characteristics that the killer would have to have absolutely have to have so he determines that the killer would have to be male um and i mean that's fairly solid the boys are all tied up they're all hogtied um and they're you know thrown into this stream they're not only thrown into the stream they're like weighed down in the stream so there was there was a considered effort to you know conceal these bodies they were they put sticks down into the mud um to kind of conceal the bodies and the same with their clothes their clothes were taken off and the clothes were shoved down in the mud and the dirt under the water and then pushed down with sticks so that they wouldn't float up and wouldn't be seen um so because obviously there's a, a bit of water that the person would have to wade through and and carry the bodies into it's determined that it would be a male because it is a you know a physically um kind of strong or something a physically strong person would do so male the second thing he determines is that it would be kind of 30s it's not somebody who's a child and it's not somebody who's old because a child obviously again wouldn't have the physical strength and again somebody old wouldn't have the physical strength so he's reckoning somebody in their 30s and um, he is reckoning that it is somebody who has a close personal connection with one or more of the victims and this is often the case i mean like you could nearly stick that down as being cert at this stage we know that now it's 99.9 percent .9 of the time someone known to the um victims or it's a family member so that's exactly what he says but the reason he says it and I thought it was interesting is because there's three boys and none of them try and get away none of them try and run so they must have trusted this person in some way shape or form so that even though you know maybe two of the boys were watching as another boy got hogtied they're saying that they must have trusted this was you know some kind of a punishment but that it wasn't going to go any further so even though it was unusual even though perhaps it was scary to them you know they didn't think they were going to die um so i mean based on those kind of things oh i'm sorry i should say as well based on the fact that the uh, boys were hogtied he determined that this person was either you know very adept in hunting or had a background in like you know slaughtering animals uh, butchery or that kind of thing so that was really interesting so based on that evidence then bob ruff goes off and he takes a little closer look at the males in the three boys lives and um, obviously the obvious ones being their fathers so one of two sorry of the well three i suppose really at the time three of them had 
um, watertight. I'm saying that in inverted commas. Uh, alibis. But he re-examines the alibis. Um, one of them is found to be fine. Determined. Yeah, absolutely. He, I think he was a, a, a long haul trucker. So he was out of the town, out of the city at the time. So right. Couldn't have been him. Fair enough. He's, he's struck out. Um, then the next guy has an alibi as well. Um, because he was actually at the time his, I think it was his stepson was in court. Um, and so he was picking the stepson up from court or something like that. So yeah, that was a fairly watertight alibi as well. But the other guy then, um, who was Terry Hobbs, um, and that was um, the stepfather of Stevie Branch. He seemed initially to have a watertight alibi but upon going back upon looking at it again Bob Ruff determines that there's actually an hour and a half that can't be accounted for and um, so as I, I spoke at the head of the podcast there initially in this investigation there was three guys that were done for it um, and subsequently they were found innocent and they were released back in 2011 they weren't found innocent sorry I should say that they they, they did an Alfred plea and um, you'll remember the Alfred plea back from our episode on the staircase so basically what it is is it's a, a guilty plea but you're maintaining your innocence but like you're still considered a murderer you know they got out in 2011 um, and that investigation how they got out was basically determined by DNA evidence so there was DNA evidence done of one of the knots on one of the boys and um, one of the knots that they were they were hogtied with obviously and a hair was found and the DNA testing at the time back in 2011 like it was good don't get me wrong but obviously it's coming on in leaps and bounds and every day there's new improvements in it but at the time the hair you know, in the wording of the law, it couldn't be excluded that it was Terry Hobbs, who is, um, like I said, uh, the stepfather of Stevie Branch. So they kind of look into him a bit more. Um, they do try and get an interview with him. He declines. But at the time, back in 2011, when this evidence was found, um, they, dis- they kind of ascertained that it was Terry Hobbs, perhaps, and the guy he was going around with. So there was another guy involved. The two of them were allegedly going around looking for the three boys um, in the truck. And that was the alibi for Terry Hobbs. That's why he couldn't have done it. But um, Terry Hobbs declines to be interviewed for this documentary. The other guy doesn't, interestingly enough. So, you know, make what you will out of that. But I think if you're innocent, if you've nothing to hide, you speak, don't you? Um, so that guy partakes in this documentary which is probably one of my favourite parts of the documentary he's you know they build it up they show snippets throughout the first episode um, and then they do the interview in the second episode with him and that's where they kind of determine that he is I'm not going to say innocent but yeah innocent that he's he's not involved in this that it's most likely Terry Hobbs um, and, and like I said they speak as well with Stevie's mother uh, and aunt and they talk about how he was violent towards Stevie's mom, Pam. He was also violent towards um, Stevie and had, you know, a history of being kind of overly disciplining him or, you know, very harshly disciplining him. The aunt uh, recounts uh, a time when Stevie was being potty trained and he had an accident and um, he was put in a closet, you know. So this kind of stuff. So this guy is looking better and better as a suspect. So um, Bob Ruff, on the back of, you know, the experts that he's dealing with, he decides to go to the DA and say, look, um, obviously we've made advancements in what we can do with DNA evidence now. Can we have that evidence back from the case? We want to test it again for DNA and see if we can determine one way or another, you know, who did this basically? Is it fucking Terry Hobbs? Um, and interestingly, the DA just doesn't get back to them at all. Um, so you can see kind of in the last half hour or 45 minutes of this documentary where there's just numerous, numerous calls been made by Bob Ruff uh, to the DA and the production um, the production department for this documentary are also doing that and he's just not getting back to them. And unfortunately, that's kind of then where 
the story ends. They can't kind of push it on any further, I suppose. So like, would I recommend this documentary? Absolutely. It's so, so good. It gives, you know, a really good information, gives really good investigation and it brings you along for the ride as well, which I love. I love feeling like I'm there, like I'm part of the investigation. But it ends quite abruptly and it ends with no real resolution. And don't get me wrong, that's through no fault of the documentary makers. Um, They obviously dragged this production out for as long as they could. And I'd say, you know, the funds ran dry um, and they can't make the DA DA, uh, release that evidence to be to be tested again. But it is a very unsatisfying resolution or ending to the documentary. Um, And the documentary kind of ends then with Bob Ruff kind of looking straight down the camera, you know, calling out to you, the public, to put pressure on this DA to release the evidence, to get the ball rolling again. And look, that's not a shot in the dark. Like, that's that's happened before. That's been done before with documentaries where, you know, um, new information has been brought out as a result of the investigation and then you know a case has to be reopened and in fact people are tried as a result of it and people are found guilty as a result of it so it's not beyond the realm of possibility that this documentary could do the same thing as well um what have i learned from this documentary (laughs) you know what i'm gonna say don't you Ah, it's fucking corrupt but yeah look basically he kind of hashes out in this documentary as well why the da wouldn't want to release the evidence so again if you're not familiar with this story this will be new information to you if you are it won't i apologize but back in 2011 when the west memphis three were um released when they did accept the alfred plea which says that i'm guilty but i maintain my innocence um that like that was on the back of huge pressure um, so obviously, as I said, there had already been two documentaries made, Paradise Lost and West of Memphis. And this this case for the first time gained international notoriety. And how the guys were able to do that case was with the help of celebrities. So um, the likes of Johnny Depp, the likes of Peter Jackson and um, Eddie Vedder of of Pearl Jam they paid the three the West Memphis three's uh, legal fees and because of the attention it got by celebrities obviously it got the attention of the media worldwide and it really made um the the legal system and indeed the police force and that within West Memphis look like a pack of fucking idiots you know and as a result they've never really admitted that the three men are innocent or that they were wrongly convicted they still maintain well we had enough evidence so they're still saying even though the guys are out they're saying no we maintain that they're still they had something to do with it and so I suppose releasing the evidence or reopening the case that says again to the world we're wrong Um, and Bob Ruff is like they're just not going to open themselves up to that ridicule without you putting pressure on them so that's where you kind of come in Um, would I recommend it yeah absolutely like despite that that is the end bit, it's disappointing, obviously, but like, how many times do we actually get a case solved? Um, I should have guessed that it wasn't going <laughs> to, it wasn't going to go, and these are the murders at the end of the documentary. But like, yeah, just being completely objective, just being, you know, um, a, list, uh, a watcher of documentaries, a lover of documentaries. I wanted a resolution, of course I did. And that is the natural um, reaction of anyone. But I would absolutely recommend watching it. Like I said, if you haven't heard of this case before, it's a really nice introduction into it. Um, it's a retelling of this case for the next generation as well. And like I said, also go and watch Paradise Lost and West of Memphis because that'll give you a little bit of backstory into it. Um, and it's always good to have, you know, a fully comprehensive look into a case. So guys, that is it. Um, as always, 30 minutes is never enough, but I hope I've done enough to convince you to give the Forgotten West Memphis 3, like I said, released at the weekend on auction, but I have got a link if you want to hit me up, give it a watch. Um, as always, I have been your host, Gemma Delaney. This is What's Up Doc podcast, and you can find us online. We're at What's up doc pod i nearly tripped over it there myself uh give us a like give us a share give us a review we'll see you next time guys good luck god bless bye bye